fall apart so that better things can take their place. I like that. I like that. Schumpeter tried to say the same thing. Budweiser says the same thing also. Budweiser beer, great things are coming. But Marilyn, I think, that's the line that I love. And what I want to talk about with you, and I'd love to try to have a conversation if we can hear each other. Can you hear me, by the way? Yeah, okay. I'd love to see, you know, is Marilyn right? That's the big question of this discussion. And what role does technology, what role does this group of people play in helping to make Marilyn right? That's what I want to examine. And um, to do this, I want to show you one image that they've already conveniently showed you once. But I want to show it again. Because I think in this one image, you know William Gibson, the prophet of cyberpunk. He has a quote, which is, the future is already here. It just is not yet evenly distributed. But in this one image, we can see three different cities of the future. And in each of these different cities, there's a very different model of how technology is used and what your role is in society from now till 2030 will be critical in determining which of these three cities we are going to live in. So could I ask the team to put on the slide with the cities? Can we have the slide with the cities? Muito obrigado você. Okay, does anyone know where this is? I was just there three weeks ago. So this is not in Brazil, obviously. This is one of the toughest spots on earth. And the question I want to ask is, can technology so close to Zambia? It's actually in Kenya. It's actually in Kenya, and it's 20 minutes drive from where the bombs went off and the explosions went off in the Westgate Center in Nairobi. It's 20 minutes drive. Now what I want to look at is, I want to present some of the problems here miles from Brazil, and then explore, are these just Africa's problems or are these global problems? Are these the same problems that London has got, that Paris has got, that Sao Paulo has got? And are there solutions to them? And if we can solve some of these hardest problems, maybe we can be optimistic about some of the smaller problems we've got in England, in Brazil, in Paris as well. So what are the three cities here? I want to ask you first of all, when you look at this, what do you notice? What do you notice? What are the big objects that you see here? Shout out. What do you notice? Hmm? The sorry? Louder. Okay, there is, there is no promise here. It looks like a broken landscape. It looks an empty, broken savanna where the crops have failed. And this is the single most important thing in the picture. These brown, broken fields. Why is this important? Because that is the root cause of the problem of urbanization. You got 200,000 people a day who flee the countryside, this broken land with no And where do they go? They go to the city. They go to Nairobi. They go to Lagos. They go to Kinshasa. They go to Mumbai. They go to Paris. They go to Athens. Because the countryside is broken. This is a global problem. It's one that even in Brazil, with the droughts in Bahia that you've seen, in Brazil, where crops are expected to fail by 25% by 2050. By water is expected to be 70% less. So what is the future here for Nairobi? Well, the real problem is the old city is just breaking. Nairobi, where I was three weeks ago, is slowly getting overtaken by the car, by the traffic jams, by crime, most recently by terror, of course. And then there's a vicious circle, because as the city becomes harder and harder to live in, a second starts to emerge. And here's a second thing 
that you will notice in this picture, which is the big signpost. So what is the big signpost for? Well, it's for a new city, a new shiny techno city that is called Konza Technopolis, $15 billion of Kenyan government money. And it's steel, and it's chrome, and it's loads of silicon, and it's uber high-speed internet connections, and it's the smart city that actually may not be very smart at all. Why? Well, where are they building it? They're building it on this land that used to be farming land. They're actually building it on land where people used to be growing coffee. And they're not growing coffee anymore because the coffee is dying. But there, in this new smart city, instead of coffee, what are they going to have? They're going to have a 12-kilometer armed, electrified security wall. They're going to have a giant mall. They're going to have a shop till you drop mall. They're going to have not coffee, but a museum of coffee. And not coffee, but a cafe where you can sit and sip your imported Lavazza cappuccino. It's probably Brazilian coffee. I hope it's Brazilian coffee, but at worst, it's imported coffee. So what's happened is this new city, does this new city give any jobs? Does it give any jobs? It doesn't give jobs. This is a new city where the role of technology is actually to create barriers, where technology is given to secure those who already have goods away from those who don't. With and this smart city is actually a very complex web of vulnerable, interdependent, high-tech systems that are going to be very hard to maintain, very hard to upgrade. And that new city is going to be surrounded by a lot of people who are going to be very hungry, whose crops have failed, without jobs that are going to give them money. So if you think the Westgate was a vulnerable target, this new city is going to be, in my view at least, equally at risk as the Westgate. It's not a resilient city. The risk is it becomes a suburbia, a place that looks better in the imagination of the architect and the fantasies of technologists than it is in reality. At this point, I hope you are feeling depressed, okay? I want you to be feeling depressed. Please nod if you are feeling depressed. Or if you're asleep, okay, fine. But what I want to move on to, because these are two dystopias, okay? One is the old city, Petropolis, just the city of the car, Nairobi, Detroit, New York after Sandy, New Orleans after Katrina. The second, and that's the city you see with the broken fields. The second is the new shiny city that's really just a fantasy. It's an escape from the real challenges that we face. But there's also a third city there. And that city, you can see, with this group of people standing by the fence. And there's a reason I bring them up. And it was partly inspired by someone who I met here today. That's one of the 16 acceleradores. It's one of the 16 accelerator hubs that Nairobi has got. And they're a group, a self-organizing group, who've just got together and they which is, can they use technology not to accelerate consumption for the rich, but can they use technology to address the fundamental problems that Nairobi and Kenya and Africa and indeed the world is facing? So just as an example, there's one group here that has got a device which checks the estrogen level of cows. And when the cow is fertile, they make sure they bring the bull in to inseminate. There's another group that addresses power. So all around the world, you've got 1.4 billion people who have got no access to power. And they're powerless because they've got no access to power. So what are they doing? Well, we all know solar lights are a good idea. But the problem with solar lights is they cost $200. And these people can't afford $200. So they're using tech. They're taking a mobile chip and they're putting
putting the mobile chip in the solar light. And that means you can do mobile banking using the chip, doing mobile payments for the light, turning it on and off remotely, which means no one can steal it. Because if you steal it and you haven't paid for it, they'll just turn it off. It's useless. So suddenly, that means you can rent this, rent the lamp for 40 or 50 cents a day, which is less than the very poorest in Africa are spending on firewood and kerosene. And what this means is suddenly they've got a bank account. Suddenly they've got power. Suddenly the kids can study for exams. Exam pass rates go up from 68% to 83%. They can make payments for insurance. Because one of their problems is they can't buy fertilizers. Because if they buy fertilizers and the rains come, they've lost all their money. But the moment they've got this, they can do micro-insurance with a company called Kilimo Salama because they can afford it, because they are covered if there is a rain or a drought. They get an automatic payment on their mobile telephone if there's a drought or if there is a flood. And then they can, even better, do micro payments for something called the Kickstart hand pump, which gets them access to the underground water table that's available to 96% of African land. And what that means is this stack of technologies is taking their average income from $160 each per year, less than a dollar a day, to $1,600. And suddenly, the market starts to create itself. Because once they've got $1,600, they can start to invest in other things as well. So why do I raise that example? Because for me, that is the DNA of a different type of capital. And it's a different type of capitalism that is made possible by a different use of technology. And it's not technology just to accelerate consumption or to help more financial derivatives on Wall Street or to help large oil companies do deep water drilling for oil with faster magnetic resonance imaging processing. This is technology used horizontally to solve the problems that billions of the people in the world have got. This question, Marilyn's question, is, are things going to get better? So is this example just a one-off freak that people like me pull out to medicate themselves with and to stop themselves getting depressed? Or are there legitimate grounds to think, OK, there's something interesting going on? I want to give you three arguments, and I'll end. I'll end after those three arguments, I promise. I want to give you three arguments why I think there's something going on here. Why I, as an author and a journalist, think there's something interesting. The first is, well, it's already happening. It's already happening organically. And if you walk around this extraordinary set of people, you'll find examples of it. Um, I'm thinking of Pastar. Where are you, Mateus from Pastar? Are you here? Okay, so we've been talking about agriculture. Pastar is a company that's there in the startup and maker space, who I just met earlier this morning. What do they do? They work in the northeast of Brazil. And they've got this just brilliant idea, which is you've got all these cows, all these animals, all this livestock that is dying because of drought. And when the animals people, their economic well-being dies as well. Their lives are ruined. So what are they doing? They're doing a model. It's basically like Airbnb for cows. What they're doing is they're finding farmers and landowners whose land at that moment does not have drought or does not have floods. And then via the app, they're connecting the cows that need to move, that need a new cow hotel with the people that have got the new cow hotel. It's just a super cool and super obvious, but brilliant idea. I wish you were here, Mateus. I would find him if he's not. If you can't find him, Mateus from from Pasta. Five hundred million animals a year dying in Brazil. So it's addressing a crucial need and helping to save a billion dollars, a billion dollars a year for Brazil. Another example that's going on is HandTalk, just a beautiful mobile app. There you are. Will you will you stand up? It's Carlos, yes? Okay. 
will you quickly say something about your 30 seconds? O Handy Talk é uma plataforma de tradução do português para Libras, a língua brasileira de sinais. E aí a gente lançou o aplicativo que já passou dos 100 mil downloads já em menos de seis meses. E estamos lançando aqui na Campus Party o tradutor automático dos sites. Então, qualquer empresa que queira tornar o seu site acessível, então, com o um simples código que a gente fornece ao cliente, todo o conteúdo em português do site, ele é traduzido automaticamente para Libras, que é a língua oficial do surdo hoje no Brasil. Ok, so what's my first argument? This stuff is already happening. Because there are just smart people who are identifying needs and doing it. And another great one, the Cidadera, the Cidadera one. We're putting power back in the hands of citizens to fix problems and communicate with the authorities, with the prefectures, to get problems solved. That's the first argument. The second argument is, it makes sense. So if you take that example of the, the solar lights with the chips, the company is called MCOPA. It's some friends of mine in Oxford that set it up. So, what is the market here? You may think that's tiny. Guess what the poorest of the poor spend on kerosene every year? How much do you think the poor spend on kerosene every, every year? Anyone give me a number? Anyone give me a billion? Less or more than a billion? 38 billion. 38 billion dollars is the market that the poor spend on kerosene, just wasting money and two million deaths a year from inhaling smoke as well. It's just a lose, lose, lose proposition. In Kenya alone, the market is one billion. But the real point is when you serve that market, it grows. The, I'm gonna give you the most boring phrase. Demand is elastic on supply. I don't know what that means either really, but it means when you feed the market, it's like Coke. They want more. The more you give the market, the more they will want of this because you're boosting their productivity, boosting their incomes. Okay? So the first reason it's already happening. That's the best reason ever. The second reason is it's a big market and it's the market where as you solve it, it grows. And that's the type of market that you want. It's the opposite of the subprime market that got us into the whole financial crisis, where as you serve it with a toxic product, it explodes and everyone goes under. This market, it grows when you serve it. What's the third reason? And I'll end with this. I want to tell you a story to this one, because the third reason is something about human nature. And this is a story about a German economist and another cow. You may say that you've had enough cows. I'm going to give you one last cow, okay? You may think also, I don't want to hear a story about a German economist and a cow. I, I understand that. But what the story is about a very special guy called E.F. Schumacher, who wrote a book called Small is Beautiful and another fantastic book called Good Work, especially Good Work. It's one of the most important books in my life to have read this. And this particular story changed my life and my understanding of technology, strangely. So the story is this. Schumacher was German, and he made the mistake of being in my country, England, at the outbreak of World War II. And so the English locked him up. But they thought, listen, he's a nice old guy and he's an economist. He's not too dangerous, so we'll put him on a farm. And they put him on a farm. And then the poor old farmer had a German economist. And if you're a farmer, the last thing you want is a German economist kicking around. You'll understand that. So the farmer had to think, okay, what am I going to do? And he came up with an idea, which is, I will get E.F. Schumacher, Fritz Schumacher, to count the cows. Brilliant. He's an economist. So every day, Schumacher went to the fields and he counted the cows. And every day he counted them and there were 32. And he reported back to the farmer, there are 32 cows. And the weeks went on, the months went on, the war passed by, Schumacher counting the cows. One day, Schumacher goes to the field, and there, leaning against the gate, is an old man. And the old man says to Schumacher, the cows, they're never going to flourish with you counting them like that. And Schumacher looks at him, thinks, what do you mean? What am I doing wrong counting the cows? Surely it is a good thing to be counting.
one week later, he counted, and he found 31. There was no sign of cow 32. And he walked around the edge of the fields, looked up and down, and there finally, in the ditch, legs up, its stomach bloated, he found cow number 32, dead. And at that point, he had what he called the most important insight of his life, which is he realized what he was doing was counting the cows. He was not touching the cows. He was not feeling the cows. He was not, if I may, or he was not checking their skin. He was not looking into their eyes. He was not checking their tongue. Please stick out your tongue. He was not checking how the cows were as individuals. He was treating the cows as a mass. He was treating the cows like the NSA treats all of us, as objects of big data. He was treating the cows not as individuals. What is the point I want to make here? We are all like that cow. We are all these beautiful, dependent, sometimes irrational, but dependent, needy, creative, productive beings, just like those cows. But we need each other. We need someone who is close enough to tell us you are losing the plot. Your life. Looking sick. We need people to tell us that, to keep us together and to keep us flourishing. We are all those cows. I believe that that is the fundamental essence of what it is to be human. That we know two things. We are a social animal. We love to be with each other. And we are a productive animal. We like to make things. And when you look at these three cities, there are two of them that fail on those counts. The first city, the old city of Petropolis, is one where now our job is really to be consumers, connected to each other insofar as we can manage to walk across the 22 lanes of motorway traffic. Then sometimes we can be connected to each other, but our real job is to be consumers, not producers. In this second city, I believe we're not even going to be connected to each other physically. In this second city, the quote smart city, where technology dominates for the sake of technology, I believe we are going to be electronically connected but spiritually disconnected from each other. If you look at the two skills that we will have in that city, I believe there will be these skills and these skills only. The first is to click. The first skill we will have and our children will have is to click. We will be these giant thumbs. And the real lesson will be instant gratification. You do not need to work. You do not need to move. What you just need to do is to click and things will come to you. The second skill I believe we will have is to swipe. We will learn to swipe. That there are zero consequences. That we can get things wrong and we can swipe away the page. We can swipe away the relationship. We can swipe away an ecosystem. We can swipe away as Elon Musk is planning to do the planet Earth and build a substitute for it. He actually proposes to do that with Mars as a backup for Earth when we finally destroy the ecosystem. I believe there is a second city there where we will not thrive because we will not address what is human in us. But I think it's in this third city where we have used technology to identify and solve the real problems that exist then we've got the potential to be connected. We've got the potential to be living in cities that are open. We've got the potential to be living in places where there are not gates that protect us from the poor, because in fact, we have done something to improve of those poor. We've got the capacity to solve those problems and to create a place 
that we want to be in. So is Marilyn right? And I'll end on this. I think she is half right. Half right. I believe great things can fall into place. I believe great things will fall into place. But do they do it on their own? I don't think so. I don't think so at all. They have to be pushed into place. They have to be worked into place. They have to be coded into place. They have to be hacked into place. They have to be modded into place. It doesn't happen on its own. It only happens when you have a group of people like this. Why? To end, do I think this campus party here in Brazil is so exceptional? And why is Brazil so full of promise on this? Because the whole country is a sort of accelerator. The next wave of growth is going to be about solving the big problems. The next Brazilian tech heroes, forget Facebook, forget Instagram. The next Brazilian tech heroes will be those who solve the problems that really matter. And there is nowhere in the world that's got a better understanding of the problems that really matter. From the favelas to the Amazon, from the social to the economic to the environmental, Brazil is the point of reference in all these risks, in all these opportunities. So you are always going to be ahead of the global competition in understanding what really works, what the real needs are, and what really works in trying to solve it. And on that note, to any of you who are still conscious or indeed still alive, I salute you. Thank you very much for your attention. Muito obrigado. I'm exhausted. If you have any questions, se falas português muito lentamente e com um sotaque britânico forte, I understand a tiny bit. Please. Uh, if you want, I can ask the question directly in English, if you prefer. Um, you were saying about uh, technology being worked towards people. And one of the things that I think are, I don't know, one of the most fantastic things are what they call micro uh, microfinance programs, you know, like Kiva. That would be an interesting thing to comment with the people here because... Um, I don't know, would you prefer to comment or...? Okay, uh, they have that. Uh, it's a kind of a bank, but they don't take uh, interest on what they lend. It's voluntarily on the internet, and you can make microfinance loans. You pay it with PayPal, and then they distribute it to people normally on third world countries. People that need to buy things for their, their small business, people that need to uh, buy things for their plantations, like you said, uh, fertilizers, or people they want to pay insurance. So they take those microfinance loans uh, with no interest because people on the developed world, they can afford that money to lend it to people. And normally you use like 25 or 50 bucks and you can help someone on the other way of, on the other side of the world. And it's something easy for people here that makes a lot of difference there. That's one of the magic things of technology, I think. Yeah, it's brilliant. And Brazil has Brazil's been fantastic on micro-lending. Brazil's done some very interesting work on micro-lending. Um, I have myself lended, I think, 100 bucks on Kiva. Excellent. I have an account there. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, and there's, there's loads of ones. There's MyC4 is really good. There's Kiva, there's Zopa, there's, you know, there's Lending Club, which is huge now. So it's very interesting. And then, of course, and then, of course, Bitcoin. Who in the room thinks Bitcoin is going to grow in value? Okay, there's a guy at the back there, Mercador Bitcoin. You can buy Bitcoins now. So you think it's going to be the death of the, death of the big banks? Are the big banks going to die? 
Yeah? Are the big banks going to die? Okay. They're too big. Too big to die. Okay, great. All right, good. Like the dinosaurs. Okay. 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 Hey, hi. Okay, interesting. Hello. Here. Here, right yes, here. Yes, please. Yeah, I'd like to hear your thoughts on what the government can help uh, people to, to make smart cities. Okay, great question. There's a super cool um, guy in Barcelona. Has anyone here been to Barcelona? Such a great city, yeah? Okay, so there's this guy who's the mayor for habitation, who is called, An called Anthony Vives, and they call him the Pope, the Papa of, of Barcelona. He's really cool. So his idea is he wants to turn Barcelona, he wants to turn it around. You know, you've got massive youth unemployment. The only industry is tourism, blah, blah, blah. So he calls it a PITO city. PITO stands for product in, trash out. And he says, the PITO city is going to die because there's no manufacturing. There's no revenue created. It's a dead city. So he is creating a network of fab labs, of fabrication laboratories. And in those fab labs... In the hospital district, they're manufacturing, they're 3D printing mobility devices for patients who can't move, hearing aids, prosthetic limbs. In another one, they're all about making equipment for solar electricity. And what he wants to do is the distributed solar. So he wants to turn the buildings into micro power plants. And as he does so, of course, reduces the cost for business of energy with fossil fuel prices growing. So he's trying to create, from Barcelona, the Pito city, product in, trash out. He wants to create the energy self-sufficient, productive city where people are making stuff again. And what's interesting is, what's the role of government? Because he's not doing it from the top down. But he's also not saying, forget it, it's up to you. We're going to do nothing except watch and wave at you. He's helping to give free government buildings. So they give empty government buildings to the fab labs. And then they give one person who goes around the different fab labs. He says it's like a Benedictine monk. And he goes and he explains, these are the templates, this is how you do it. So it's a model of government that is government as plataforma. Government is not telling you what to do, but it's conditions for the creativity of the citizens to come through. And his model is that that is how cities will compete. The best cities will be the cities where the mayor and the local government are harnessing the capabilities of their citizens to produce. Austin, Texas is also interesting. Please. You know that one. Yeah, it's really good. Uh, hello. Uh, hello. I like your hat. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, you said about uh, solve the poorest problems. Yes. Uh, I know. I want to know your opinion about the Brazilians' uh, programs of distribution of money, like Bolsa Família. I wasn't here in I wasn't here in June at the latest um, protests, but you know. But when I say, you know, Brazil rest of the world in you know, how do you address social and environmental challenges um, you know if you want income inequality Sao Paulo is a is an extraordinary an extraordinary example um, what do you think you know it better than I do what do you think Well, I uh, personally don't agree with them because I think they uh, feed the problem, not solve them. Because Programs like the Bolsa Familial? Yes, because the poor families become dependent of that. And the conditions to, to have these uh, benefits, I, in my opinion, not fair enough to uh, feed the problem. Okay, do people agree with him? You agree? 
Half and half? Okay, who disagrees with him? Okay, so I'm going to stay out of this then. <laughs> we have the same debate in England. There's a TV show called Benefit Street that just came out, talking about a whole culture of welfare. It's tough. It's very tough. Very tough. I'm staying out. I'm saying nothing. I'm saying nothing. Uh, I would like to give my opinion on what he said. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, the thing is, uh, problems like Bolsa Familia, they do have some, uh, some things that you have to fill to enter them. But sometimes the government doesn't feel that, doesn't command that person to go after a job. That is a problem. But in some regions, of, like the Dross region in the Northeast, it's easy for us here in Sao Paulo to say like, oh, come on, anyone can go and get a job and just do these kind of things. But on those poor regions, it's actually people, they live in such a state of poverty there that they can't actually even start to find the job. So that's where Bolsa Familia enters because it gives the, people, well, the necessary money for the minimum living. Uh, so the people disagree with him. Is he like a bleeding heart liberal? Or is he okay? It sounded good to me. It sounded good to me. It sounded humane and compassionate. I'm left, I'm center. But right people say I'm left and left people say I'm right. Then you're right. in a good place. You're in a good place. If everyone hates you, you're doing fine. Okay. Eu queria complementar uma informação sobre o Bolsa Família que as pessoas não conhecem. É, eu conheço, por ser educadora social de projetos ligados ao Bolsa Família, que ao contrário do que as pessoas pensam, o Bolsa Família não, não, não pretende ficar alimentando a pessoa eternamente. O, tem cursos gratuitos, profissionalizantes, somente para os beneficiários do Bolsa Família. Tem cursos no SESI, tem cursos profissionalizantes por diversas ONGs, Concordo que é, há uma falha na comunicação. Nem todos os beneficiários sabem disso, mas há esses cursos. Uma coisa que todo mundo desconsidera, que entre os bolsistas, as famílias beneficiárias, 96% das crianças estão na escola. Sim, a gente precisa melhorar a escola. Mas se, muitas dessas crianças estariam pedindo dinheiro na rua ao invés de estar na escola. Todas as crianças precisam ser vacinadas. A médio e a longo prazo, a economia para o governo, por conta da saúde dessas crianças, é algo imensurável. Então, eu, eu só queria deixar a dica. Quer saber mais? Claro, você não precisa concordar. Mas primeiro procure conhecer o SUAS, o Sistema Único de Assistência Social. A gente, às vezes, acaba criticando sem conhecer tudo o que está por trás. Ou visite um CRAS que é o Centro de Referência e Assistência Social. Toda cidade tem esse CRAS e o pessoal lá pode dar mais informação. Falo como ex-funcionária de um CRAS e minha família trabalha com assistência social há muitos anos. Eu acho que a gente precisa é, debater mais o tema para quebrar esses paradigmas equivocados. Ok, eu só entendi 20, 28% of that, but she has to run for president. And I, I want her in my country, please. Okay. Uh, if you please let me, I would like to say just a last sentence about this. Uh, Bolsa Família corresponds for less than 1% of the federal government budget here. So it shouldn't be a reason for people to get so angry at it. Because they, use, they normally say like, oh, we are paying taxes for the poor. No. What you're paying is going to Bolsa Família. It shouldn't be a reason for such a fuss. I'm with you. I'm with you. Parabéns. Parabéns. We have maybe one last question, Natalia. Yeah. Well, it's not a question, I, I just... Please, even better, then I don't have to speak. It's fantastic. <laughs> it's good for you, it's you good for me. You can add. Everyone's a winner, okay. Uh, we were talking here about uh, planet Earth and things that, that we can do to make the place that we live better. And here at Campus Party and in Rio de Janeiro, Sao Paulo, all over Brazil and Vale do Silício, we have angels that are investors. And But when I see a person like you traveling around the world, talking about hope, it's a kind of angel, not an God investor, but it makes me very happy to see that there are people uh, kind of journey in this world, talking about hope. It makes me so happy. 
uh, happier than talking to an angel investor because this is what feeds the spirit of people on this earth because we can have a lot of money in this world but we, if we don't have hope and love and compassion we have nothing we have a desert uh, with no forest with nothing if we don't have compassion with, for each other so I think that's why Campus Party is so cool because we're here connected and we have friendship and we have much more than just investors and angels. When we can see, we can meet people, wonderful people like you. Today I had the pleasure to have lunch with you. So I, I would just like to say how happy I am to that we can have people like you traveling around I'm the world. So, I'm so happy to be Thank here. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. So happy. When I say I love Brazil, I love Brazilian people. I love the openness of the heart. There's no other country like it. Obrigado. Obrigado. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Campus Party. Muito obrigado. Muito obrigado. Thank you.